Wow, what's that aftershave you're wearing? Soul of Detroit is so powerful, it drives women right out of their minds. That's why we have to put instructions on self-defense in every package. Soul of Detroit smooths and soothes and cools. Soul of Detroit. Be careful how you use it. You ask in a rug and touch it right my face. It's gone. What are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. You might be qualified, MLB. I'm not qualified for this job. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, Elric? Hey, kids. It's your old pal, ML Elric, coming to you from the cloud, from cyberspace, from we're not sure where. We have a full show with a lot of guests, and we're going to dive right in. Uh, first, let me introduce Mark Fellhauer, who has been, uh, he's been endeavoring to persevere to pull this all together. And of course, Sean Windsor's coming to us from the finest garage and backyard you've ever seen. And maybe one day you will see it, not just because you're stealing his bike. Sean, thanks for taking the time now that you're furloughed and have loads of time to join us. Oh, it's always my pleasure. I'm so glad Mark did not listen to you on the intro today and actually kept it under 30 minutes. That was fabulous. It was nice and brief. We're getting right into it. Thank you, Mark. I knew you'd appreciate that, Sean. Yeah. Yes, Thank I, you, Mark. I might appreciate your interest in Mark's briefs, Sean. Well, the less you listen to Mike, the better, Mark. I mean, right? Isn't that kind of how this goes? I might have actually taken more out than uh, you asked me to, ML. So that was for you, Sean. <laughs> well, well, we'll we'll fix it in post. And we have a special guest. We are auditioning a new feature this week in Soft History. And uh, that is going to be led by uh, our friend and uh, now collaborator, Mr. Matt Jennings. So we'll have that a little later in the show. Matt, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. (laughs) Excellent. As you can see, he's well appointed. And if you guys want to check out any of that sweet swag, we're almost out of T-shirts, but we still have some hockey jerseys at DrewAndMikeStore.com. We're brought to you live on Facebook until this thing crashes on us by uh, Broadwell Homes. Lindsay Broadwell is uh, our Facebook Live sponsor. Uh, A word about Facebook. We love it when you watch it. We love it when you share it, but you're not getting the whole show. If you want to get the whole show, especially Room 7609, you have to listen to the audio version of the show. So please uh, tell your friends to check out the audio, watch the video. Basically, you know, you're locked in your house. You probably stink. Watch it, listen to it. What else do you got to do? Please. Use your time wisely. But Lindsay Broadwell is our Facebook Live sponsor. And if being locked in made you realize that your house is way too small, then it's time to call our new realty sponsor, Lindsay Broadwell. Your house is one of your most valuable investments, and that's why you need an agent you can trust and that knows the business inside and out. Lindsay started her career at Hall Financial, and now she's an expert in real estate. She will make sure you get the most out of your house and that everything goes smoothly by finding you a new home that fits your lifestyle. Buyers, sellers, especially first-time buyers, make sure you contact Lindsay Broadwell at broadwellhomes.com or 248-767-7767. She's a licensed retailer at REMAX Nexus. That's broadwellhomes.com, 248-767-7767. Tell them ML sent you, and Sean has promised me he will put down your down payment. So, Sean, thank you very much for stepping up in these difficult times. It's, I'm happy to help. There he is. He's got a big heart. And that's the only... Anyways, we stay away from Sean's appendages. Which I you, think, always, uh, you always do always seem oh, to go hey, there. That's the FCC. Sorry. Let me just... Okay. Sorry. We, we can say whatever we want. It's the internet. Once you buy that house, you're going to need to finance it. And there's no better buddy better out there than Hall Financial. David Hall and Hall Financial care about the community. That's why they are working from home, but they're working around the clock to help people by saving money when they refinance. It's a great time to look at your options. That's why many people are refinancing right now. If you haven't refinanced in the last year, Hall Financial is here to help. Now's the time to lower your monthly payments, keep some extra money in your pocket as we go through these very turbulent times. And by refinancing, you can probably skip up to two payments. So why not see if you can save some money or cut your term by calling my man, Dan Morrison, at Hall Financial. Hall Financial has five, no, 1,500 five-star reviews for Michigan homeowners. Go to their webpage and click on, or go to our webpage, click on their logo, or give them a call at 248-308-5000. 
all financial lower payments, better options, more personal attention. That's Hall Financial, 248-308-5000. And you can always find them on our website. That's mlsoulofdetroit.com. So we thank those guys for pitching in. They have been around uh, for quite a while and they're keeping us around. And one of the things I really hope we can get through this pandemic is by people following the rules. And I know people are mad at the governor because they're like, why can't we do this sooner? Why can't we do that sooner? Let me tell you why we can't. It's because of you. I was at Costco last week, which for me was a pretty adventurous trip. And I saw people without masks and I saw people dragging their kids along with them. Sometimes dad would have a mask on, but the kid wouldn't. They're touching everything. They're jumping in line. And I don't want to judge people because I know childcare can be an issue. So I'm going to forgive the bringing your whole damn family to Costco thing, but they're not wearing a mask. And then you don't put a mask on your kid. And then I thought, well, maybe it's tricky because masks are hard to get. Maybe it's a, it's a financial issue. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, everybody's telling you how to ma- make a mask yeah. out of an old sheet. Sean made some out of an old pair of underwear, but I think he normally, <laughs> actually, you know, and maybe he did that before the pandemic. Let's, let's just move past that real quick. But you know, there's no, no reason reaction. not to have a bandana on, not to have a kerchief on, not to tear up an old sheet, put on your damn mask so we can get out of this. Yeah. I want to go to a bar. Come on. Do your part. It's not that hard. And then I'm driving up to East Lansing, which is now legal, to cut the grass at our rentals. And I'm driving down I-96, and I look to my right, and the golfers are out there. Thank God the golfers can get back out there. But these jackholes are out there driving carts, which they're not supposed to do. Oh, really? So if we want to get through this thing, folks, just, just make the smallest effort, if you wouldn't mind. Don't you think the vast majority of people have followed the rules and gotten along and done what they're supposed to do? I agree. I like your optimism, Mark. Pants driving golf carts, so that's a bunch of people who well, aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, you saw 10 people, and you're going to castigate 5 million that live in the metro area. Come on, man. <laughs> could I'm have with been a, you, Mark. It could have been a private club, ML. I mean, can't they exactly. stay in carts? I, I think golf carts are out, no, no matter what. No, no, the ownership of the course obviously violated the, the rule, but, you know. Yeah, Mark's so, point is that way, most golfers, people are trying to do their thing. Golfers, that sport involves no exercise. Walk! Please. Okay. Enough on that. Sorry. Care about um, all aspects of a their little, health. A little follow up to our fine young cannibals appearance in uh, in room seven six oh nine. My buddy Bobby Richards, who we've mentioned before on the show, stagehand at Fox Two, great guy, super helpful, handy dude. He tells me that the fine young cannibals shot their first MTV video here in Detroit at the Fox Theater back around 1989. I said, Bobby, how do you know? He said, because I was a stagehand at the theater at the time. He said, the guys were super cool, very nice to everybody. So it's good to know this fine young cannibals, while they may eat you, will at least be very (laughs) polite about it. So, uh, so thanks for that uh, tidbit, Bobby. And um, I have an incredible story. Uh, Two weeks ago, against my better judgment, we started the show talking about a lost dog. And now we have an update on the lost dog, which has me feeling a little bit like Casey Kasem. We're up to our long distance dedication. And this one is about kids and pets and a situation that we can all understand, whether we have kids or pets or neither. It's from a man in Cincinnati, Ohio. And here's what he writes. Dear Casey, this may seem to be a strange dedication request, but I'm quite sincere and it'll need a lot if you play it. Recently, there was a death in our family. He was a little dog named Snuggles, but he was most certainly a part of... Let's come start again. Uh Uh-oh. I'm coming out of the record. Play the record, okay? Please. See, when you come out of those up-tempo goddamn numbers, man, it's impossible to make those transitions. And then you got to go into somebody dying. You know, they do this to me all the time. I don't know what the hell they do it for, but goddamn it, if we can't come out of a slow record, I don't understand it. Is Don on the phone? Okay, I want a goddamn concerted effort to come out of a record that isn't a fucking up-tempo record every time I do a goddamn death dedication. Now, make it, and I also want to know what happened to the pictures I was supposed to see this week. It's a god, last goddamn time. I want somebody to use his fucking brain to not come out of a goddamn record that is, uh, that, that's up-tempo, and I got to talk about a fucking dog dying. He treats his uh, engineer and producer just like you do. 
Yeah, where are those pictures, Mark? I don't know. Where are those pictures I'm supposed oh, to be? Yeah. That is fabulous. It is great. So that's uh, Detroit's own Kamal Kasem. You know him better as, as Casey Kasem. So two weeks ago, we asked uh, folks here on the east side to keep their eyes open for Charlie, a little shih tzu who disappeared. He is the pet of a woman named Kelly Kelsler, who is uh, undergoing chemotherapy. A couple weeks ago, she was having treatment. Her friend was dog sitting and let Charlie out in the backyard. Charlie snuck out and was gone for a couple yep, weeks. Yep. So I was like, okay, uh, our next update will be an obituary for Charlie. Yeah. Well, a bunch of people who knew Kelly and some people like uh, my old friend, Lynn Pellerito, who had never met Kelly before, rallied to the cause, got armies of people out there looking for Charlie, putting up posters, putting up flyers, putting up everything you can imagine, Facebook page, GoFundMe, people who knew Kelly, people who hadn't talked to Kelly in 20 years, people who didn't know Kelly at all. This army mobilized, and believe it or not, so I, I got to tell you what Ed Murphy, uh, a former colleague of ours at uh, the Detroit Free Press said, he was putting up posters and signs, and he said the last poster he put up was on Chatsworth and Mac, bit of a tough neighborhood. He almost skipped it because he was worn out and he was heading home. As happens, God loves a trier. So he might not, God might not love some of, some of Casey Kasem's language, but he loves a trier. And uh, this last poster, this last sign that Ed put up, wouldn't you know it, right after that, Kelly got a call from a nice young guy saying the dog had followed him home from a pizza place, huh. but he couldn't keep him. So he moved the dog to his cousin's house out by city airport. By midnight, Charlie was back with Kelly and uh, the young man collected a tidy reward. Um, hmm. And Kelly is getting a chemo treatment today. Yeah, so we wow. hope that that process goes as well as the dog search. So hmm. an amazing end to a story that I thought, had tragedy written all over it again. Glad. Uh, I can't believe they actually found the dog. I also kind of surprised he collected the reward, but you know. Yeah. So I, I thought, uh, and the reward was a thousand dollars. So I'm That's sitting here thinking, hefty. I think I might give someone suffering from cancer their reward back or just pass on it. But um, maybe he needed it too. I don't know. Yeah. But, but I'm told that there was so much money in the GoFundMe account that it easily covered the reward. So maybe that was uh, something that uh, made it easier. But the bottom line is somebody who needs this dog, this dog is, is a uh, uh, almost a, a therapy dog these days. So wow. there's a, a happy ending there. I can't believe it worked. From the east side. And uh, one last thing before we bring in our special guests, um, I have to share an email that was sent to me at the Free Press by a nurse who says um, people are not wearing their masks right. The mask needs to cover both the nose and the mouth. <laughs> the nose is the first line of defense. I've seen a lot of people with masks that just cover their mouth. Our RN says if someone sneezes without the coverage of a mask, the droplets cover quite a distance. So that green death you're spewing, uh, knock it down. By wearing your mask properly. Do your oh, part, folks. Very, if we get our shit together, we can get out of this thing. Very angry about the masks today. Well, it, it, this, it, this is a bad thing. I mean, this is an easy thing. It's sort of like saying... Hey, we're trying, I man. Save a life by making no effort or I could let somebody die. It's, a new, <laughs> it's new. We're trying. We'd love to um, bring in a couple of our guests now. Uh, this is a story that everybody but Sean, I think, read in the Detroit Free Press <laughs> about but Amber Gorby, who worked as the retail sales manager for hometown pharmacies. These are 36 pharmacies throughout the state of Michigan. There's a couple of them, I think, down in Indiana. And um, they're a, uh, a chain based in Nuego, Michigan. On March 23rd, when the governor issued an executive order that was actually quite explicit this is the reason why we're here and why most people are working from home. She directed Michigan businesses and operations to temporarily suspend in-person operations that are not necessary to sustain or protect human life. The executive order went on to prohibit all businesses and operations from requiring workers to leave their homes unless those workers are necessary to sustain or protect life or to conduct minimum basic operations. Now, Amber's job was ordering some of the things you would find 
at the uh, checkout counter, at an end deck, the things that as you're leaving the pharmacy, you might say, oh, you know what, I forgot this, or oh, hey, that looks pretty cool. I bet somebody would like this, or wouldn't it be nice to have this? She was not ordering medicine. She was not performing transplants, but her boss, according to a lawsuit that her counselor, Jack Schultz, has filed, and according to a complaint that Amber filed with the Michigan Department of Occupational Safe and Health and Health Administration deemed her work essential. Amber, thanks for joining us today on the Soul of Detroit. Thanks for having me, Mike. So how are you doing? It's been a few weeks since you raised your voice. Tell us what happened uh, after you told the boss, hey, I think the governor's talking to you, Pally. Uh, I went back to my office for a couple hours and around three o'clock in the afternoon was terminated. So, so take us take us through that day a little bit because I think that's the that's the pretty quick and clean version of it. But there was there was some back and forth. Uh, yeah, it started the week before when we had uh, an employee that was struggling with finding childcare for a foster child. We had made arrangements and it had been approved for him to work from home, only to find out later that he wasn't approved to work from home. And uh, according to uh, my boss or basically the president of the company, Mr. Grice, that we were going to continue business as usual. And uh, we had another meeting the morning or the afternoon of Monday, March 23rd, in which uh, business as usual, again, nothing was mentioned about working from home and following the executive order. And so I brought it up and that did not go over well. There was definitely some um, sense of frustration and anger on his part. And then uh, all sides retreated, and there was another meeting that day where it was a much smaller gathering, right? Correct. Yes. At that point, it was just my boss and Mr. Grice, and I was brought in the conference room and told that I was being terminated for uh, differences of opinion based on the meeting earlier today, earlier that day. And you were offered some severance, as I understand, but there was some other things that you believe you're entitled to that were not a part of that package. Correct. It was a non-disclosure agreement offering eight weeks of severance. And I asked twice in that meeting to be paid out my bonus, which was scheduled to be paid out later that week, according to a meeting I had had earlier that morning and some other discussions I had had. And I was told that that bonus was not going to be paid out. And that was significantly more than the eight weeks of severance and was based off of our 2019 sales goals. Okay, so just so folks know, the uh, the president of Hometown Pharmacies, a gentleman named Jonathan Grice, I spoke to him shortly uh, after this uh, this whole uh, deed went down, and asked him. Um, basically, I, I shared Amber's account of what happened and asked him to comment on it. He said that's not why she was terminated. He said that's not accurate. That's not how we would treat a longtime employee. And we should mention Amber was going on seventeen years with the company. And it appears they had a pretty good year selling the things that she's in charge of stocking. So I'm led to believe she's a pretty valuable employee. Um, He declined to elaborate and we invited him to come on the show today. And we invited him to have his attorney come on the show today. You're going to meet Amber's attorney in just a minute. Uh, We have not heard back from Mr. Grice. So we do want to represent all sides. We're doing our best. But when you keep your mouth shut, that's the way it goes. Amber, have you ever been written up in the previous 17 years? Has there ever been any other issue that you're aware of? No, I've always received positive performance evaluations that are given out annually. In in that first big blow-up meeting of that day, did anybody else speak up? Uh, Not necessarily on your behalf, but from their own concern. You know, you mentioned the person who couldn't get health or uh, child care. Did anybody else speak up? Yeah, a couple other people did speak up, um, not specifically about the um, executive order as I did, but one asked about finding out if employees were comfortable working and helping out in the store locations. And another employee expressed a concern about a couple of our team members that were immune compromised if they were going to be allowed to take unemployment uh, during this so that they weren't exposing themselves to the risks of the virus. Now, I've been in meetings that get pretty contentious uh, where people, you know, raise some issues. But when it gets really bad, they all tend to, sh- you know, kind of shut down except for the one person. Is that what ha- is that what happened here? Did it get that bad where everyone's like, oh, boy, this is Amber's uh, fight now? 
Um, typically in a lot of the meetings that I'm in, in these situations, nobody speaks up yeah. ever. They just don't, they don't say anything. Um, so that's pretty common in a lot of our meetings, but I definitely got the vibe from other people after this meeting. Uh, one employee told me that I asked the questions that needed to be asked. Uh, another employee during the meeting said to another employee that um, the meeting needed to be stopped. This wasn't this wasn't healthy. Um, but again, nobody spoke up receiving that message. It's just uh, nobody wanted to question or follow and figure out why we weren't following the rules. It's kind of a almost like an intimidation thing. Is there any track record of uh, your, your ex- ex-employer doing something like this to anybody else? Like just firing them for, I guess, maybe uh, challenging him or any other reason if they haven't been written up before? I'm not going to speculate on that. Jack, do you want to <laughs> do you want to defer to Jack? I don't know. Yeah, let, let's bring in uh, let's bring in Amber's attorney, Jack Schultz. Uh, if that name sounds familiar, you may have seen the case that he where he represented employees at Founders Brewery who were suing for discrimination. That was a case that not only made me bummed out whenever I would see all day IPA on a shelf, but it was uh, successfully prosecuted by Mr. Schultz and um, and founders that, uh, admitted some wrongdoing. And I believe they're going <laughs> to they were going to donate the proceeds from their tap house to good causes. But now it's closed along with everything else. So hopefully, hopefully uh, you weren't going to get a piece of that action. Well, uh Generally, it, it seems Founders has taken steps to uh, remedy some of the issues. They actually have not admitted any guilt in oh. the situation, but uh, regardless of, of admitting guilt or not, it seems that they've taken steps to address some of the things that are going on. Uh, you're correct that they were going to donate some of the profit from, or I, I believe all of the profit for the uh, tap house here in Detroit uh, to various causes and things along those lines. And, well, I'm um, donating all the proceeds from this podcast to uh, yourself, Mark and Sean oh, and Joey. Um, uh, that's, that's zero divided by four fellas. So uh, <laughs> now Amber, uh, Amber, in your previous 17 years, yeah, wisely. you clearly you've been ill and couldn't go to work. Did you ever do any work from home? Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely worked from home previously uh, when my kids were sick, when I was sick, when deadlines had to be met and I wasn't able to make it into the office or, um, you know, there's times you have to go above and beyond and I've definitely worked from home previously. So that wasn't uh, anything new to me. Is anybody- so, Jack, what's wrong with what happened here? Well, so I think generally speaking, context of all this is important. I mean, everyone's correct that businesses are scrambling. A lot of businesses are out there doing uh, things correctly and are making, you know, good faith efforts to follow these orders. But then there are situations like Amber's where there are businesses that seem to be very clear that they're going to not follow the orders and uh, do what they think is best. So in her scenario, I think it's it's pretty clear cut. You know, she had worked there for 16 plus years without issue and then uh, abruptly was terminated following uh, protected activity, speaking up about how the orders weren't being followed. Uh, that morning, uh, Governor Whitmer issued executive order number 21, which was referenced earlier, which uh, specified that non-essential employees, uh, sorry, you're, you're uh, sitting at home for a while. And uh, essential employees, you, you are able to work, but under certain conditions, including social distancing, masks, things along those lines. And I think uh, one thing that was very clear from the executive order, because uh, it's written in there about 20 times, is that if work can be performed through telecommunication, it must be performed through telecommunication. Essential or not, uh, if you can work from home, uh, you must. And so here, Amber had a track record of working from home. And she brought that up Other and was uh, terminated shortly after. And, and I think what, what's screwy here as well is that she, you know, she was fired for speaking up. Whether or not ultimately they determined she was right, she was wrong, and we strongly believe she was right, uh, ultimately she was terminated for asking questions about 
whether or not they were breaking the law and refusing to break the law. And Michigan protects that. Uh, there's a claim for wrongful termination and violation of public policy, and that, that's what we filed. So you, you, it's simply because he did not like being challenged. Well, I don't want to speculate as to why he did it. It could be ego. It could be not wanting to be challenged. It, uh, but, it, but, you, but you think it's this certain, one meeting that really made him fire her? Well, I think there's a lot of circumstantial ev- evidence that supports the idea that, you know, he liked to be the, the big dog and didn't like to be challenged in that, uh, you know, she spoke up. She pointed out that what he was doing was illegal. A couple hours later, she's terminated. She sent a letter saying uh, shortly after, don't talk to employees. We're going to tell employees the, the real reason why you were terminated. And uh, which I, I'm actually excited to, to hear <laughs> what they're alleging the real reason is, if not for the comments during the meeting, because they previously provided a letter in which they, they said that was the why. So I don't see why she would be able to talk about that. And likewise, as discussed earlier, they, they offered her a... Uh, Settling. What uh, she characterizes hush money, uh, severance, but again, context. Severance can be viewed as, well, hey, you worked here for years, we're going to take care of you, but that's not the case here. She was owed a bonus, they weren't going to give it to her, uh, they wanted her to be quiet. This came, you know, hours after her protected activity, and she was a faithful employee for well over a decade. So it's just the context of it is uh, all sorts of fishy, and uh, I'm happy I'm able to step in and help her. So, Amber, the letter that um, that hometown's attorney sent to you said, stop coming around the office, stop telling people stuff that's not true. Uh, can you set us straight on, were you going around the office? What were you telling people? I mean, what are they referencing in this letter? Uh, the letter basically said I was not allowed in their um, business, in their retail stores, which I had not been to at all since I was terminated. And I received you, that letter. CVS and Rite Aid now, right? Pardon me? You, you much prefer CVS and mm-hmm. Rite Aid now, right? I will admit I've been in Rite Aid already. And uh, I also, yeah, we transferred our prescriptions or my husband did at least to Meyer. So, um, you know, it's a change for us. I, I worked there for, like Jack said, a long time, over a decade. So, um, I, I had not been I had not been back to the office. I had not been in the retail store in the week and a half since my termination when I got that letter. I had been talking to employees. Um, several employees reached out to me. I had not even reached out to them. Um, I'm friends, uh, close friends with several of my teammates and several of the employees that work in our stores around the state. And uh, a lot of them reached out to me. I reached out to some of them and Again, I believe 100% that I was terminated for speaking up for following the executive order. And that is what I, you know, talk to some of those employees about that. I believe that's why I was terminated. Okay. So in short, the letter's a bunch of hooey. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Sean Windsor, what do you make of all this? You're our expert on workplace uh, uh, politics and, uh, and, and legal issues. Well, as you can see, I'm a lawyer by the uh, hoodie that I'm wearing. <laughs> I think um, no, it's uh, it's 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 crazy. I mean, it's it's a classic kind of whistleblower thing, right? Anytime anybody speaks up, and the management or the uh, the ownership doesn't like it, their uh, their instinct is to silence that instead of just adjusting and admitting and and moving forward. And it's just it's too bad that that's so often the instinct, right? I mean, and we see this over and over, obviously in politics too, but. Uh, that's what's that's what's really too bad here. Amber's clearly trying to do the doing the right thing, and like as you said earlier, when you saw the golfers and the people not wearing the masks and so forth, I mean, we all have to do our part. She was trying to do our part, and she unfortunately cost her job. Hey, Amber, that that second meeting is, is really fascinating to me. The one where they wanted the non disclosure and the severance, um, and they handed you the termination letter. Um, did you immediately say no? How, how did that happen? And how empowered did you feel when you said no? I'm I'm not. I'm not signing this. Uh, I didn't say no right away. I mean, I, I'm one that I like to think about things. I specifically read through the entire non-disclosure agreement. It was about a page and a half. Uh, I did have a couple questions on it, which at time, uh, when I had those questions, the HR director that was also in that meeting with myself and Mr. Grice, she answered one of the questions and clarified something on there for me. 
Um, that's when I asked about my bonus because it said nothing in there about my bonus. Uh, Mr. Grice kind of deflected answering that question. So we talked a little bit more about the non-disclosure agreement. I went back and brought up the bonus a second time, at which time he said that won't be paid out. Uh, I briefly read through it, you know, a little bit more and knew in my gut I couldn't sign it, but I definitely made sure I read through every point of it before I told him no. And I gave him several opportunities to uh, give me that bonus and extend that to me, I think, which would have been the right thing to do. But he did not. And at that time, I informed him I wouldn't be able to sign it. Ooh, did you rip it up in front of him or wad it up in a ball and throw it at him? No, I very politely slid it back across the table. Well, that's a power move, well, though. Why didn't he just talk to you, Amber? I, that's what I don't understand. So often the easiest course is just to have a conversation and ask you, right? I mean. I think there were some issues with communication uh, with him specifically. There had been some communication issues ongoing the last year or so. And I think that he felt uh, questioned, uh, defensive, angry, frustrated. I think that the termination letter was kind of written in uh, heat of the moment, spur of the moment kind of thing. And this was just, he didn't like being questioned and therefore I was going to be out. In the in this, this heat of the moment thing, uh, Jack found something interesting in that term, termination letter. Jay, I, I, I didn't even notice it when I read it. Oh yeah. So uh, you can tell it was so haphazardly put together that he actually spelled his name wrong. And, <laughs> in, in, Sliding it to her. And oh. they, you don't see that as, as some sort of indication that maybe this letter is manufactured, that you guys gin this up on your uh, on your dot matrix printer somewhere in the basement at uh, at Gorby Manor. Of course not. No, okay. And, and I, I have to jump in here on behalf of Hometown Pharmacy, who is not a sponsor of the show, but they have not acknowledged that there was a non-disclosure offered. They have not said anything about refusing to pay a bonus. In fact, they haven't responded to those questions, but I think we should, uh, we should put that out there. But, um, but this is going to be resolved um, either through my OSHA or through the circuit court as this lawsuit proceeds. Are you, do you guys see this as something where, I mean, because you are, you are plowing some new ground. We haven't seen a lot of lawsuits filed based on the governor's executive orders. This, this is a whole new world we're in. Do you see yourselves um, taking this all the way just to make a point and uh, get these guys' heads on straight and maybe lay down the gauntlet for other workers? Or is this something where if you can come up with an equitable settlement, something that's fair to Amber and that the company is willing to do, that, uh, that you would, uh, you'd be happy to get this thing behind you? Well, I think generally speaking, from a plaintiff's perspective, we're always open to resolution. The, the goal and desire is to get things resolved faster than dragging them out. Uh, Ms. Corby's out of work right now, and she had a position that she loved. She's, uh, Nuego is not a very uh, sizable town, but it's a pleasant place to live, and it's going to be difficult to get another position like that. But, you know, they wronged her, and she der- deserves to be compensated for what happened. Whether or not they're willing to do that up front is – Really, uh, they're in the driver's seat up. Now, in regards to uh, shaping the law on these types of claims, I I do think the wrongful termination in uh, regards to public policy is pretty well shaped already. I I think it's a valid claim that we're bringing. I think uh, one of the interesting things that has occurred so far is, uh, I I don't want to brag on it too much, but demonstrating the uh, inadequacy of some of the uh, filing systems of, of small counties across the state, uh, whereas whether it's Wayne County or Oakland County or Ingham County, uh, you're able to, to file online uh, in order to file cases and participate in litigation in New Wago County. You really have to mail everything in, uh, return envelopes and things along those lines, and, and it's uh, slowed the procedural process a little bit. Hey, As I understand it, you initially filed it by wrapping your complaint around a brick and throwing it through a judge's window. <laughs> Do you think that's going to hurt like, your chances of prevailing? Not any favors. Well, well, actually, what I did was I, I sent it attached to a messenger pigeon, and I made sure the pigeon had its mask on uh, very tight on its beak and uh, gave it directions directly to the Nuevo Circuit Court. We can see why Amber hired you among the many barristers out there who were champing at the bit to take this case. 
Hey, Amber, before we let you go, can you tell us uh, how you've been getting through these these times? Clearly, this is not a time when anybody, nobody ever wants to be without a paycheck, but you walked away from eight weeks pay with nothing. And uh, how, what of impact is that having on you? And, and what do you want to happen here? Uh, ultimately, what I want to happen is I want the company to follow rules and take care of people. Um, it can't all be about profits. We can't be making up our own rules and picking and choosing what we're going to do and what laws we're going to follow. Um, I have been spending a lot of time with my kids. I've been exercising. I've been um, delving into my faith a little bit more, communicating with friends and family and book clubs, just trying to stay positive. There's so much negative right now uh, that I'm just trying to find positive things every day to keep myself occupied and busy with. Okay. And before we let you go, we, we just were joined on the line by Hometown Pharmacy. Oh, I, sorry. I, I guess you're going for a dial tone there. I guess that's their response. Yes. I did. We should have workshopped that. Anyways, I'll fix it in post. Amber's full story, you can find it at freep.com. We'll throw a link up in our show notes on our website. That's mlsolvedetroit.com. Amber and Jack, well, I guess everybody's got a lot of time on their hands. Thanks for giving us some of it. And uh, we hope that justice will prevail. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having us. Go Spartans. Ugh. Oh, green. Really? That's going to hurt your case. Thanks, You're going for the green. It's going to hurt you in the case of the court of public opinion. <laughs> Amber, thanks again. Thank and, and I hope you and your family are safe and well. Thanks. You as well. Yeah. Thanks, Amber. And we, we hope Jack can find a barber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope you, Jack, you'll never play for the Yankees looking like that, that son. <laughs> I hope, ML, I hope you can find a barber. I mean, you did fix your hair, but before we joined, oh my God, what a disaster that was. Yeah. Your hair is so yesterday I went to the mayor's uh, daily press briefing, which I'm going to have to jump off uh, to pick up at two. Um, I went there basically because I wanted everybody to see what my hair looked like in the 1980s. How narcissistic. It was. Uh, That's was a shock. <laughs> there was a lot of hair there and there was, there was quite a, uh, it wasn't quite Morrissey-esque because I didn't know about product back then, but there was, there was quite an awning of, uh, of dead cells there sheltering my rather large nose and forehead from have, the, have you cut your hair at all since the uh, quarantine? Uh, so yeah, so I have a trimmer. Uh, I actually need to, if they sponsor us, I'll get the man skin, but I've been kind yeah. of trimming here on the sides and I take yeah. some scissors and cut over my ears just because, uh, I don't want this thing to flare out. I'm not looking for wings. Now you look, I, you look my wife, my wife, tr- she trimmed up my, my hair. So, not the top, but the the sides. So I guess I guess that's the new world we're living in. Are you going to go for that shark? I know you're a big soccer fan. I remember when Beckham brought that stupid shark fin look in. Is that your? Uh, is that maybe? What you're maybe if it annoys you, maybe I'll do it. Sean, what about you? Sean, you I don't, don't have any. I don't have any hair. You don't I need a haircut. <laughs> I kind of like strands Sean. on the side grow out, and you know, it's all, it's, it's all good. I love Sean's Sean look. His technique with me, he gets some static in a balloon. <laughs> the hairs stand up. They get out some hedge trippers, <laughs> uh, clippers. And it I mean, the, the one issue I, I, you know, the thing that I guess I would worry about a little bit is the ear hair. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Sean, you look like the most comfortable man in Michigan right now. I don't know why the hair is oh, all over no, the place. Oh, no, I just, You're... I don't know, you know. I mean, I, I, like I'm on a furlough, right? So, yeah, uh, no, I don't. Yeah, that's right. And even if I wasn't on a furlough, we're, we're right at home and do? uh, doing Zoom calls. And, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I, I mean, would, I don't know. I, I wish I was you. Look, you know how it is. The older you get, the, the hair starts coming out from all sorts of spots and the back of your ears and right on the cartilage there. I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, uh, Mike probably has uh, has somebody shave it for him. He's he's worried about his appearance that way. He's vain. Yeah. You and I, I, you and I Mark. Or, I never felt as old as I did until a time we were driving and one of my daughters grabbed this e- this hair that was growing off my ear and pulled it. Oh. And I, I don't want to say she was invading my space because the the hair actually was poking in. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite long. Right? It's great yeah, when you those, get to a bump. Those odd hairs that just kind of come out of your <laughs> wherever, you know. Isn't it nice when you don't have to impress anybody anymore and you just do whatever you want? doesn't matter what you look like. Who cares? It's yeah, great. Mike will get there one day, Mark. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. I, hope. yeah, I, I was excited. I got to wear a shirt with a collar and a tie because I, I, I every once in a while I walk around 
And I don't want to go all Barney from uh, How I Met Your Mother, but I'll, I'll open the closet and I'll see all my suits and I'll say, God, it'd be so nice to put on a suit. But it's like, I don't even need to put on pants. No, I don't want to wear a suit ever. It's part of the reason I do what I do. It's, it's, a, it's definitely a perk. Oh. And of course, there's all the, the great, uh, there's all the great logo gear too that, as I mentioned before, I haven't seen the cash register ring in, so maybe I didn't say it loud enough. But you can get all this great gear, our show, other shows, at drewandmikestore.com. Sean, you, you've been, uh, you were talking to us last week about this Michael Jordan uh, series on ESPN and have written about the bad boys. And I'm with you all the way. I, I think the bad boys do not get the credit that they were due. Watching those epic series against the Celtics, finally breaking through against the Celtics, trying to get through the finals with uh, the Lakers, finally overcoming the Lakers, and then kind of being felled by the next dynasty. And I, I, you made a point in there about Lambeer that he really was ahead of his time. This was a big man who could stick the three on you. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that series as it's wrapping up? You mean the last, the last dance series? I think they're. Yeah, the one you said you want to talk about. Yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last dance. They're. Um, nice. Yeah, it's uh, there's it's still. Brian Jennings are a bitch. No, no, no. It's halfway. Uh, I think it's halfway through. No, I and I wrote a column about this uh, leading up to this because I knew that the the focus was going to be on the bad boys and the that team versus Jordan and the Bulls and so forth. I, I my point in that column was that they played. Uh, really kind of beautiful basketball in a lot of ways. They were, yes, they were very physical. They had a lot of cheap shots. It was part of the game. They weren't the only team like that. They may have taken it to a slightly different level in some ways, but they were a really, really skilled team with one of the best backcourts in the history of the game. I don't want to get lost in that and and for this podcast and go down the rabbit hole of just what happened on the court. What's interesting about Sunday night is the, with this, uh, the documentary is the focus on, this idea of Detroit is kind of the second city, even though Chicago is technically the second city, right? At least in terms of theater. And um, the, the, the way Michael Jordan and the coach of the Bulls, Phil Jackson, dismissed that era of the Pistons basketball as bad for the game and as sort of not, and that they weren't worthy champions. And it played into this idea of how so many Detroiters feel, right? That their mm-hmm. cities look down upon. And, um, and I've, I've seen the last couple of days, last couple of days, it aired Sunday night, just the reaction all over social media and talking to people. It's, it's opened up these old wounds and how, and what that rivalry is about. Michael Jordan was the icon, the NBA's golden boy, what they wanted to promote. And here were the interlopers from Detroit. And it's just been interesting that 30 years later, these emotions are still so raw in so many ways about identity and how we think about ourselves. I, I, I love the fact as a bad boy fan and a Pistons fan, you have Michael Jordan, greatest athlete in history of sports and it still bothers him all the things he accomplished and he still hates the pistons and i think that's great and the pistons have been overlooked right you know everybody thinks it's celtics lakers bulls um then lakers again and then warriors people forget about the pistons and the jazz i didn't the jazz the spurs were in there yeah the jazz were good people forget about yeah the spurs they they get overlooked because they don't have the superstar but, yeah, they, but the, they, had, they had the admiral, and they had Tim Duncan too. Yeah, but Tim two Duncan, consummate professionals who were very quiet. But they're boring, so they didn't they didn't generate much heat. But uh, Sean didn't didn't Isaiah play a role in keeping um, uh, Jordan off the Olympics? No, no, yeah, the other, other way, way around. around. Well, yeah. the, the story was always that Jordan helped uh, spearhead an effort to keep Isaiah off the dream team, the original dream team, the uh, basketball team for the Olympics. It turns out Scottie Pippen and Magic Johnson. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of that, but some of that stemmed from the way they played. I think part of it was when they dealt with this Sunday night, and this is an interesting conversation too. Remember, the Pistons walked off the yeah. court yeah. and didn't shake hands. So it's been about uh, you know a lot, that that hurt the legacy of the bad boys too. I really there's think there's that image of Isaiah ducking, right, Mark? Oh yeah, yeah. Like no one could see him leave, you know, and Lambeer kind of leading the way. I I really think their excuse though is is ludicrous because the Celtics did it. That it's okay that we do it. I think it's a little childish. Well, I'm, it is. I, I have no pro- I have no problem. I agree. That they it's did not it. an excuse. No. It is hypocritical that Larry Bird did the same thing in '88, right? It walked off but, and didn't take any heat for it because it it fed into that idea of toughness and grit but, and all that that the Celtics played with. Whether is the, the the Pistons were seen as classless and thuggish, obviously a loaded word. 
But it's not just that. Lambeer went on TV the other day and talked to Bill Lambeer and talked about, instead of what the Celtics said, all he said that Phil Jackson and, and Jordan's diminishing of their accomplishments the year, year and a half prior, especially the day before they went to the Chicago Tribune in a press conference yeah. and talked about how they weren't worthy at all. And so it was Lambeer's like, well, screw that. They don't deserve my respect if they're going to talk and whine and complain and try to denigrate us like that in our accomplishments. And to this day, he owns it and said he would do it Good. again. Good. And whether I'm, you agree with that or not, I respect that in a way. Isaiah's tried to walk it back. Yeah. Well, Isaiah's uh, kind of the king of liars. So, you know, uh, exactly. What, what are you going exactly. to do? It's too bad. But in any case, so Sean, you may appreciate this. Um, and I just pulled this out of my file cabinet. I covered Jordan's retirement press conference for uh, the Daily South Town, which is a paper on the south side of Chicago, and uh, saved some of this stuff. Um, my my lead on my story basically said, so Jordan retired, you know, the world goes on. I'm sure everybody in Chicago is like, who the hell is this who wrote this? I'm like, I'm a guy who loved the bad boys, so don't try and tell me <laughs> that the course of human history is going to change because this uh, – this what? shitty baseball player, gambling freak, and egomaniac uh, is retiring. Which but, retirement, uh, by I the way? Them, and it is very, very nice stationery. It's gold embossed. You know, I mean, this is some, this is some pretty. Oh, that's really sick. Okay, Mark, did you grow? Did you grow up around here? Oh yeah. Uh huh. And you, because you were talking to me, and I know Mike's been here a long, long time. What is it about, from your perspective, this team, the Bad Boys team? that made it so uh, so popular that, that folks around here identified with Because I was here during that era too, but just it made it so beloved. It was so Detroit in a way, right? Well, looking back now, I understand, you know, the hardworking, the lack of respect. When I was a kid, first off, it's your hometown team. But looking back on it now, I I like Dennis Rodman. I like that character. I love John Sally and Rick Mahorn, Dumar. I just, they, they're guys that I liked rooting. Really, I never really cared about Isaiah that much. Um, and yeah, Lambert, no, I like player. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I don't know why. I just never never really cared for him, um, you know, making out with magic in the center court. Never really did much for <laughs> me. <laughs> but um, I, I think it was those rookies and the young guys that I really, you know, as a kid, I was like, oh, this is great. And they were tough, man. They It That's was different. Right. It was different. It wasn't the Lakers. It wasn't the Celtics. That's yeah, no, it's it's the it's the toughest thing, and the, and that's kind of what's been on uh, trial again the last few days. It's just it's just interesting to me that, as you said, Jordan, it still bothers Jordan. That that's good, some of these though. things, and that's that's why we're so fanatical about sports in some ways. They just those emotions don't go anywhere, do they? They just fester, or they or at least the very least they sit there. Can you? And here we are, thirty years later, Sean. Can you think of a feud that is today as bad as that was? It just, I don't feel like it happens anymore because. You mean outside of college football or? Yeah, outside. Yeah, I mean in professional sports because players move, move around a lot more. They're in contact with, they're more friendly with each other now. They are, you know, it's very, it's very different. I mean, the Celtics and Lakers didn't like each other back then. The Red Sox and the Yankees, maybe yeah. in the early 2000s and the 90s, they were. You know, there but was do they still have to there? But it's, it's not the same because no. you're not physical with each other like you are in basketball. And that hate's not going to go on for another 20 years. You know, uh, the Red Wings and Avalanche were kind of right. that way for a while, yeah. too. But that, that's about the closest one, at least in terms of Detroit. But right? that, but that yeah, kind but of even subsided. You had McCarty and Lemieux getting together exactly. uh, not too long ago. So, yeah, I couldn't imagine Lambeer and, um, you know, and Jordan doing a signing or anything together. I just I couldn't see it. No, it's interesting, too, just the idea of the bad boys. You said you don't like Isaiah. And our champs aren't clean, are they? They're messy. They're, they're like our area. They're, you know, we, we love them, but, but we see and we acknowledge the, uh, the warts, so to speak. I hate that's such a weak way of describing it, but uh, it, it really is kind of fascinating how, how and why that team has endured yep. here and, uh, and how differently it's seen around the rest of the country. And then it got under right. everyone's skin. It's, it's good stuff. We'll have a link to Sean's column on our website, mlsoulofdetroit.com. And, uh, and we want to hear your thoughts. We love getting your emails at mlsoulofdetroit at gmail.com. You can give us a call at 313-288-9070. That's 313-Butterfield-89070. And we uh, are going to be bringing uh, our friend Matt Jennings. Matt, you still, you still out there? Did you fall asleep? 
Oh, I'm awake. I'm awake now. Okay, great. So, so Matt, stand by. We're going to get to you in a minute. But first, we got to slug it out a little bit with our great debate. I won't change my mind on anything, regardless of the facts that are set out before me. I'm dug in, and I'll never change. Ray Nun, Ray Nun, Ray Nun, Ray Nun, Ray Nun, Infinity, Ray Nun, Infinity, plus one. No. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Or <laughs> great debate sometimes. So this is this is a, an issue that I think we're going to be hearing more about as the race for president heats up, and that is the sexual assault allegations that have been leveled against former Vice President Joe Biden by a former staff member who claims that he basically put her up against the wall, grabbed her by something that the uh, incumbent president uh, said he grabbed somebody by or could grab somebody by, and in general paid her some unwanted attention. This comes now, uh, 20 or 30 years later, in the Me Too movement. And this is an issue where I don't know how much it would have been reported at the time. It was discussed at the time. But we've talked an awful lot about uh, Donald Trump's alleged sexual assaults. And the media has been taking some criticism for not giving this the attention it deserves. Now, of course, the reason everybody knows about it is because the media has given it some attention. Fellas, how, how should people be handling this? How should people be thinking about this? This is, this is, uh, this is, not, this is not friendly um, friendly Joe. This doesn't sound like Sleepy Joe. This sounds like Creepy Joe. Well, so, you know, there's there's two aspects. We always talk about reporters versus pundits. I mean, they're very different. I, I'm, I'm shocked that uh, CNN, MSNBC, to my knowledge, have barely even touched the topic. Um, and maybe they're just pandering to their audience because they don't want to hear it. But it's I think it's totally fair game if you're going to do it for every, um, you know, accuser of Trump, if you're going to do it for every accuser of Brett Kavanaugh when he was having his hearing and – I do think that's a little different because that was televised straight for two weeks. So it was a little more out in your face, but they had no problem reporting any of it. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm really surprised that there hasn't been more coverage of it, and I think they should. Well, it's starting to. Excuse me. I know the the main national papers have started writing about it. I saw a story this morning or last night that a neighbor of the accuser has corroborated the story, and I don't remember where I saw that. I don't know if it was Politico. Yeah, um, I think it was. Yeah, but uh, so you're starting to see it more. I think it's interesting. Uh, you're right, it was a little bit different with Kavanaugh because of the, the televised and the hearings. Um, I don't personally believe that uh, if you're talking about the punditry, I don't remember a lot of attention being paid to Trump's sexual assault accusers. Now, the videotape from The Apprentice was one thing, right? But uh, I don't remember a lot of that. That was sort of dismissed. Here's, here, oh, to I, me, I though, what's fascinating disagree. about all this is that, pardon me? I disagree. I, I feel like I saw a lot of it on uh, I on just, uh, not, I don't remember seeing a lot of it on CNN or I don't really watch MSNBC, but, um, so maybe, maybe they dealt with it a lot, but, uh, and Fox probably didn't, right? So that's probably how those two, tr- two tried to balance each other mm-hmm. out. But to me, the, the, the fascinating part of all this is that, you know, it's just, there is a certain hypocrisy within the Democrats, right? When it comes to this. Because we tend to, and I shouldn't say we, but Democrats tend to push that and are more concerned about that. And, um, right? Well, that's because I think it means a, a lot more to their the base. Made, what's his name quit because he may have he may have touched somebody's bottom and he Al Franken. didn't touch a breast and he, maybe he kissed somebody. I mean, Al Franken got machine gunned for a hell of a lot less. No, he resigned. And the fact is, is that this, this here's the difference. This may well he stick to Biden. Bayonet. Yeah, exactly. He may, he may well, this may well stick to Biden, especially if the, if the reporting keeps happening, which it may, it, it, it probably will, based on what we've seen in the last few weeks. This may stick to him in a way that it never stuck to Trump. I mean, he, he's had 20 sexual assault, 20 plus sexual assault allegations, right? Yeah. I'm not talking about the apprentice stuff. Yeah. That didn't stick to him at all with his voters. They don't but care. But this will absolutely stick to Biden. Why, why do you guys think that is? Uh, because I think most of Trump's base, they don't care, and Biden's base seems to care. However, the question is, does the rest of the uh, people that are going to go out and vote, the rest of the electorate, do they do they care? I don't think so. I really don't think it matters. I, I do. She's, but, if but, she's but, telling the truth, Mike was kind of ma- making light of it, but 
He didn't just grab her. He digitally penetrated her, according to the accusation. I know. In an office. Oh, that's, that's, that's rape. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm just saying when people are going to vote, that's not going to disqualify. No, right. I understand what you're saying, but you're right. However, people dismiss it. But to me, I, I don't know. I don't know how you dismiss it. However, that. that base for that side, if they're so mad about it, they're not going to. That that is an issue. Vote for them, and they're not going to go out and vote. Yeah, you know? and, and, and approaching this as a reporter, every politician I've ever covered supposedly has a baby, a girlfriend, you name it, somewhere, and it turns out at least one of them did. But uh, which reminds me, you can get the Kwame Sutra at <laughs> DrewAndMikeStore.com. But in looking at this this accuser, there there's a uh, there's a protocol that's been established for the reporting of alleged sexual assault. And some of the steps that reporters are using to screen these allegations is number one: is there any evidence? You got a blue dress, okay? Don't have that. What's next? Did you tell anybody at the time? Is it in your diary? Is it in your journal? Did you tell your neighbor, your sister, your mother, your friend, your counselor, your doctor? Uh, was there physical evidence? Was there a police report? Anything like that? And and what journalism has decided is that if you have some contemporaneous, uh, I, I don't really want to call them witnesses, but people you confided in at the time, that that, and there's enough of them, that's good enough to report this. And by that standard, I think the media and the media has reported this. I think the question is at a front page story. Uh, we've used that standard to report this. And, and I, I kind of go back to the, the devolution of, uh, of our politics. Uh, Douglas Ginsburg was denied a seat on the Supreme Court because he smoked some pot with some students while he was a Harvard mm. law professor. Bill Clinton had to deny that he um, he had ever inhaled marijuana smoke or that he had dodged the draft. Well, right after that, the guy who replaced him was a guy who dodged the draft by going into the National Guard, who did all kinds of cocaine, who was a drunken idiot. And then uh, then Obama, and I'm talking about George W. Bush, then Obama, when he's running for president, by that time, he's too young to have Vietnam be an issue, but he admits, yeah, when I was in college, I did cocaine. You know, I had lots of girlfriends. You know, I mean, and now we have Trump who's been accused of assaulting people. Now that Joe Biden's being accused of assaulting people, are we at the point now where that doesn't matter anymore? I mean, to your point, Mark, is this one of these things where we've now become inured to this sort of conduct where it's just like, of course, everybody who runs for president has done something like this. Look, they never reported on any of Kennedy's stuff. You never saw FDR in a wheelchair. You never saw Taft on a horse because they protected it. That is so out of the window. I guess the question. Protecting horses with Taft. What's that? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because they bowed. Um, I I guess the question is. Uh, well, Look, if it's your, if it's your guy, you don't want to believe it, right? Or, or gal. But that's, I mean, but that's, that's wrong. That's just general. wrong, isn't that wrong? No, I, it's completely wrong. It, it, of course, it's wrong. And um, well, I, but that's just, but that's the way it is. That's the I way it's become. It's become politicized. Does. What we do is we create a checklist. Did you lay hands on a woman without her invitation? Is your kid, or do you have a kid but, who's an idiot? And do you have a kid who's in a dirty business deal? And if that's the case, we cross them off, and all that we have left is to talk about the issues. At what? Well, that's the other thing about them not covering it is, you know, it is pretty salacious that would get eyeballs for whoever covers it, just even the accusation. I guess that's my question for you guys. At what point of an accusation is it worthy to turn it into a bigger story on on one of the cable news channels or one of the broadcast nightly news shows? I, I know, ML, you talked about, you know, if it's corroborated, if there's other witnesses, but the problem is, is that you're battling the online world where it's already out there. But I've seen it in the Washington post and the New York times. Now now it took a while. I don't really consider them news. That's more of a a good looking people who don't know what the hell they're talking about. Given they giving you their opinion for a million dollars a year, but they'd be talking about it right now. Wouldn't they? Yeah. If there weren't a pandemic, Uh, (laughs) they, well, they, they might be talking about it more. And I do think, yes, with a news vacuum, you know, I mean, I keep going back to that jetliner that disappeared that CNN would give us daily updates and nothing was new for months. Loved it. You know, there's not news. You, you, you take what you have and you run with it. 
But I, I think the question now is, is this front page news anymore? Because we've seen, we have a president who's been accused of this and worse. And uh, yeah, it is. It still is. I mean, it's, it's been reported, but I mean, should it be front page news? Should we be yeah. talking about every day? And I think that's well, the question that people in the media are wondering. And it's certainly something that people, you know, the funny thing is Trump supporters want to talk about this all the time, but they don't want to talk about their guy's stuff all the time. And I hate that well, double standard. Let me ask you this. Um, if, if an organization is ignoring it, are they ignoring it because it's their guy? Are they ignoring it because, well, you know, um, Fox News or, or one of the other channels had it first, so we're just not even going to go down that path? Or are they not reporting it because they just don't believe the allegations or there's enough evidence to report it? Well, I think they've determined there's enough evidence to report it. I don't think anybody's determined who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth. But I think the question is, should this be in heavy rotation? And I think Sean has, has, has kind of answered that for us, which is, there's bigger news. And I, I would suggest that I'm supplying the other part of that answer, which is we got a president who's done creepy stuff or is accused of doing creepy stuff. It's, but, but it's, it doesn't it's not matter, as big though. a deal the second time. No, but the problem is, is that really where we want to be? Yeah, let you people know, decide. I mean, Obama was never accused of any of that, by the way. He, yeah, he smoked weed and whatever. Can we can we make Except a distinction between being a, an asshole occasionally or doing drugs when you're young or having an affair and I'm not going to cuss here and freaking rape or sexual sure. assault. Can we make a distinction between that, please? I'm not saying for you to be <laughs> sure. But it just, it's, 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 if you sexually assault somebody, like if you digitally penetrate them with your finger, you shouldn't be in public office. It's not that complicated. Well, if we believe the accusers, those are our choices. Finger. I, I know they're terrible. And uh, grabby Don. Sean, so. you, Sean scared me there. No, I agree. I'm sorry. I just, uh, I, I get it. We make mistakes. We, we do certain things, but that is not. But wait a sec. But wait a sec. Shouldn't he have a trial? Shouldn't he have due process? Uh, both no, Trump, I understand. Biden, but I'm just saying, it, 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 and of course he's going to deny it, but yeah. I'm just saying that if it's true, that should be the end of it, right? I mean, Christ sakes, Gary Hart but had to get off the campaign trail for having a fling. Different times. Different yeah, I know. Times. Is, is that something? Mm -hmm. The bar is lower for now. Oh, it's way lower. So, so I, I'd be curious to hear uh, who this accuser plans to vote for and what, what she thinks should be done. I don't think that this story is over, but as it develops, we'll revisit this in our great debate. Oh, man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Did I do that? What a dork. Does him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek or we're turning into cool guys? Once again, competition for our Geek of the Week honor is heated. Uh, our runner-up this week is Louisiana megachurch pastor Tony <laughs> Spell, who's facing criminal charges for driving a church bus backward towards a protester outside the church. Now, you may have heard Pastor Spell's name before because he was charged with six misdemeanor charges for defying stay-at-home orders by holding worship services with hundreds of people at his megachurch Life Tabernacle near Baton Rouge. According to the Washington Post, a member of his flock is also facing charges for swerving his car towards a protester. No one was hurt in either incident, but no, that's not I don't, think, not I don't think Jesus would have done that. Guy who doesn't care about your fellow man and who ignores all the common sense and who puts, you know, whatever hoo-ha over science is not enough to get you Geek of the Week. No. Our Geek of the Week is once again a multi-headed monster, and that would be the evening talk show host at the Fox News Network who for weeks ballyhooed the miracle drug, hydroxychloroquine. They talked about it all the time. I'm talking about Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, and Lou Dobbs, and Fox and Friends host, who kept saying that this is going to be a wonder drug. From mid-March to mid-April, according to the Washington Post, they criticized people in the media and the medical establishment who said, wait a minute, we need to do some more testing here. We need some science. We need to find out whether this is really going to help you or whether this is a desperate Hail Mary that may end up hurting more people. Well, my friends, now that we find out that hydroxychloroquine, just as I finally figured out how to say it, they're going to get rid of that. <laughs> may not be, and I'm not saying it that well, so maybe it'll stick around another week, may not be as good for you as people have said. 
A study released by the Veterans Affairs Department says that people have a high drug rate, uh, excuse me, that people with the disease showed the death rate among those given the drug alone and in combination with another was higher than for those people who were not given the drug or a combination. There are other studies that have said, you know what, this might not be the thing that pulls you across the finish line if you're walking a little too close to the light. In fact, some of these studies have been suspended. Now, I think the science still needs time to run its course, but the bottom line is they were pushing this hard, and now that it looks like it might not be very useful, they're not talking about it. And they're not talking about how maybe they were a little premature. I'm pretty sure Tucker Carlson is almost always premature. I think that's why he has that look on his face. But the issue is, as a reporter, as the media, when you say something might be great and evidence indicates that it might not be, you are obligated. It is your duty to let people know that. You don't say that this is a media conspiracy. You don't try and cover up for your good buddy at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. You have an obligation to report the whole story, beginning, middle, and end. Uh, dude, come on. It's propaganda. <laughs> say it. It's propaganda. They're full of shit. They're not. Well, they, they know full well they're just doing that because Trump said something. Let's just be real here. That's why they're geeks. They're much more than geeks. But we'll just say for now they're geeks of the week. They lied through their teeth, knowing full well that uh, they had no idea what they were talking about, and they caused harm to some people. Can I'm we also, sick of it. Can we also say don't get medical advice from a podcast or a news show or television. Just get it from a doctor. Although I do yes. think one of the reasons I recovered was because of Altus beer. <laughs> okay, that's no, that's true. That's that's good. I can't rule it out. So they've, um, they've never killed maybe anybody. I'm being too kind, but Fox News talking heads, Laura Ingram and company, Janine, other geeks, you, according to Sean, suck. You are fake news. No, I don't and, have. Uh, I don't, they knew what they knew what they were doing, that, right? I mean, clearly. Anyway, we don't need to get lost in all that. Now, I have no imaging for our uh, our next feature. Which is this a trial feature? Are we bringing him on as a trial here? This is a probationary hire, the most patient okay. man in podcast. We've made him wait way too long, Michael. He's got nothing else. But to do. I had to let you jump in on Geek of the Week. We could have got there a minute earlier, <laughs> but you wanted to insult. Oh, yeah, that that was the problem with Sean. Yeah, that, yeah, my 15 second <laughs> interruption. You're right. That that was the problem. That's that's 30 seconds we can save. Uh, so, so Matt, uh, it's good to see that you not only look fantastic. Matt, tell us a little bit about what you do for a living because I think people need to know uh, the public service you perform. Well, I am a chassis hauler. I haul RV chassis and uh, commercial chassis out of Detroit chassis to Elkhart, Indiana, and sometimes to Iowa. But most importantly, I am the editor of Soft Magazine, which is one of the uh, the most, uh, probably one of the most amazing magazine outlets in the entire nation. So I'm excited to represent them today. It's oh, right you sound like the- Elric. You know, you're, you're in good company here. I like yes. that. <laughs> Self-promotion, pat yourself on the back. That is awesome. Welcome. I love, I love Angry Sean. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> it's been the best. We've asked, we've asked Matt to join the show uh, because one of the things that we hope we're doing is helping you get through this crisis. And, uh, and we do talk about some heavy subjects sometimes, but we also want to keep it light. We want to give you a reason to, uh, to crack a smile every once in a while. If not, break forth into uh, uproarious giggles or guffaws. So Matt has kindly presented for us a little feature that he likes to call, and we're we're happy to allow him to do so, this week in soft history. So Matt, take it away. Okay, let me, I have to find it first. Uh, okay, I got this. That, He's bringing props no, for those not watching. Oh, okay. He's throwing- oh, hey, yeah, there's, I had to pull my Michigan State hats out to find my piece. Put them in the garbage? I- yeah. <laughs> all right. I uh, found my piece. All right. And guess what? I'm not nervous at all. So isn't that good? You shouldn't be. No one's listening. <laughs> all right. Well, this is what happened this week in soft history. Now, 
I know he likes old stuff, so we're going to start early. Oh, man. In nine, 1900, the first known occurrence of the word hillbilly was printed in the New York Journal. However, according to Wikipedia, the first known entry was Railroad Trainsman Journal in 1892. But like I said, I found that out on Wikipedia. I mean, we can't, we, we know what that site's all about. <laughs> For instance, I looked up M.L. Elric on Wikipedia. It said he's an American journalist. It said nothing about him being an all-powerful, fiery sex god like he keeps telling us. This is pandering. This is pandering. You just earned another week on no. this show. <laughs> no. Not, not, <laughs> not if angry Sean is. Now you're playing with said. house money. All right, in 1913, Gideon Sunback of Aboken patents the zipper, putting scrotums all over the world in danger. Something about Mary Fan in the crowd there somewhere. (laughs) Oh, boy. In 1974, Mama Cass Elliott collapses before an appearance on The Tonight Show, where she was due to perform. Luckily, she was immediately rushed to the hospital on a flatbed truck. Uh, Matt, this is a little known fact. Mama Cass also puts scrotums in danger of being crushed. She was very large. Yeah, she was very large. In fact, the uh, rescuers right. were continuously pouring water on her to keep her alive. I'm not even going to give ML's joke a rim shot on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in 1981, Philly Steve Carlton is the first lefty Ooh. to strike out 3,000 yeah. batters. You guys ever been struck out by a lefty before? I'm not falling for it. It's like, no. getting, it's like getting pitched <laughs> to by a stranger. Okay, I get that one over with. What if you're left-handed? I am left-handed. I know you are. That's why I brought it up. So am I. What if you're ambidextrous like Mike? <laughs> oh is he? I'm, I've got why long are you toes having, as well. Why, why are you eating lunch right now, by the way? What's that? Why are you eating? You've been eating lunch this whole time. Do you, see, do you understand what's going on here, Mark? When he's not the center of attention, of course he's going to get, he's going to eat or do whatever. No, I know I'm surprised he's not mowing the lawn. I'm surprised. In Twenty minutes. I got to jump and cover the, uh, no. the mayor's daily briefing, so I'm trying to be efficient. I know that, but you've been eating lunch ever since Amber was on. I'm a growing boy. Didn't you eat at eleven? No, at eleven I was talking to you about what we were going to do at noon. <laughs> oh, so so you wait until we're recording it on camera to eat. So you got to get to the mayor, me. right? I got you. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, enjoy your meal. We've we, 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 we stolen your momentum. Keep going. You're on a roll. <laughs> Sorry, All man. Right. <laughs> All right, and actually, same sentence. This works out perfectly. In 1992, McDonald's opens yeah. up his first food restaurant in China, trading the threat of deadly worldwide epidemics for explosive diarrhea. Yes, the uh, pangolin nuggets are very popular. Good in 1993 in Ames, Iowa, Fire Maid 6 commences with Willie Nelson, really? John Cougar, Cougar Mellencamp, and Neil Young performing for a crowd of 40,000 angry migrant workers who thought they were attending a job fair. Is that a tie into the hillbilly joke from the top? Full, full circle. All I know is he just went from 92 to 93, so that's slowing down there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we're almost done, Sean. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. This will be this will be over soon. Uh, we were going decade to decade. We were doing great. What the fuck? Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. In 2006, Rascal Flats guitarist Joe Don Rooney weds Playboy's Ooh. 2005 Playmate of the Year Tiffany Fallon in an intimate ceremony held on a beach in Cabo, Mexico, which overlooked a festive reception area, beautifully decorated tables, and a very eager donkey awaiting on stage. Thanks thanks for keeping it classy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, all of them. (laughs) In 2008. Oh, he's got more. There's more. We're getting closer to today. Did Matt mention he's a trucker? (laughs) No, that's good. I like him. Oh, boy. In 2008, Bon Jovi guitarist Richie Sambora was sentenced to three years probation after admitting to marrying the craziest bitch on the planet. Heather? This is, is that Heather Lockyer? Matt, do you like it? Pam Anderson, too. Matt, do you like it when uh, we just let the joke hang there? Um, I feel like Maz right now. <laughs> the, no, you're the doing, difference you're, is you're doing you better read than this that. twice. You're doing much better than he did. At least you can read them. (laughs) (laughs) Matt read this before the show started. That's the difference between him and Maz. Yeah, true. Exactly. All right, we're almost done. In 2013, Glenn Campbell's publicist told members of the press. Wait, say say it again, ML. You're you're cutting out. 
Well, so I, I said, I, I think Matt was done a while ago, but keep going. <laughs> no, he wasn't cutting out. It was his uh, whiskers, whatever that is, scraping the microphone. Take it easy, lefty. Good one, Sean. Yeah, I got a right, too. You know? In 2013, Glenn Campbell's publicist told members of the press that his client was no longer capable of performing on stage due to advancing Alzheimer's. Campbell, Campbell planned on recording one final album called See You There, which featured him performing renditions of his old tracks that he called brand new songs. Wow, so it's sort of like the reverse of the Taylor Swift thing. <laughs> I'm glad you think that Mitch is funny. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, you're still no, you're it helps. <laughs> Matt, uh, that's a that's a strong debut. We are looking forward to having you back. <laughs> oh wait, no, one no. more. Oh no, one more. One more. Yeah, take it all back. <laughs> yeah, oh, boy. I like the self editing. It's uh, the self awareness. It's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> go for Thank it. Thank you guys. Strong ending. Go for it. You have no, one no, more. Come on, come on, go, go, go. Okay. And- Finally, in 2015, London, England's Sunday Times estimated that Sir Paul McCartney's bank account sat at over 730 million pounds, making him the wealthiest musician in the UK. He was followed by composer Andrew Lloyd Webber at 650 million pounds and Chrissy Metz at 500 pounds. <laughs> I, I thought you're bringing it back to Mama Cass now. Where, where's the rim shot? For, oh, for oh, that oh, one, I never to Mama Cass. Come on, Mark. <laughs> well, it was, care for that guy. it was nice being on the show for once. No, for no, no, one that time. was fun. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 not just a part of the show, as you can see. He's a customer. So, uh, <laughs> so Matt, thank you very much. We would love to get your feedback. We will carefully screen it because we don't want anybody to harm themselves. Please let us know what you think about any part of the show. And what do you think about our new feature this week in Soft History? You can write to us at mlsoulofdetroit at gmail.com or give us a call, leave a voicemail at 313-288-9070, 313-Butterfield-8910, or excuse me, 9070. Matt, thank you very much for joining us and be safe out there. And thanks for helping to keep the trucks on the road because that's our lifeline. We really appreciate it and tell all your your compadres out there that – that uh, T-shirts are still only $25 at Drew <laughs> I don't care for that guy. Me neither. Too no. soft. See you again. There's an all-night party in room 7609. We've been keeping kind of update uh, upbeat in room seven six oh nine. So I so I thought I don't want to you know foster any any bad vibes, but just coming out of a comedy comedy cavalcade like that, I think we can put up with a band that uh, when John Peel the. BBC broadcaster who helped break so many bands, particularly new wave bands, heard them. He said, they're not so much new wave, they're dark wave. Of course, well, I don't know, maybe it's not of course, they never made it that big, but I'm referring to the clan of Zymox. Mark, let it spin.
that is a day by the clan of Zymox. This is one of the more unusual bands you're going to hear on and News songs. 7609. They are from Nijmegen, which is in uh, the Netherlands. And if you know Nijmegen, you probably know it because that's a town that the Allies liberated during one of the biggest failures of the Allies. Uh, it was a, uh, an Operation Market Garden, which was memorialized in the movie A Bridge Too Far, starring just about everybody in Hollywood, including Sean Connery, Robert Redford, Anthony Hopkins, you name it. But uh, this little town produced Zymox. Zymox is, um, is kind, of a, kind of a gothy new wave band. I ran across them while listening to some other stuff, and uh, just they really, they really struck me. I really like them. That particular tune makes me think a little bit of Flock of Seagulls, the way it starts. And if you watch the video, the haircuts make me think a lot yeah. of Robert Smith. But in doing a little research on where the name came from, I ran across a website called queensofsteel.com that said that one of the band members picked the name Zymox because he always wanted to be called Zymox, a very <laughs> strange desire, and because it's a bastardized version of Zymotic. Well, what is Zymotic, you ask? And so does everybody who sees the word. What is Zymotic? Uh, it's, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, one definition is something caused by fermentation, which is good because I like a lot of things that are caused by fermentation. But this is where, uh, where there are bigger forces at play than the rest of us and why they may be selected for Room 7609 uh, this week, even though we didn't know this. Zymotic is related to or being an infectious or contagious disease. So I, oh, nice. I find their, uh, their somewhat um, uh, bleak musings to be very infectious. Uh, gentlemen, what, uh, what did you think of our, our plan of Zymox? Um, no, thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I had to run to the pharmacy. I didn't hear any of it. That's a, that's a, that's uh, a, it was a interesting. Okay. It's, uh, it's not something well, I probably will listen again. You'd be happy to know they're still on tour, by the way. Well, and it's not uh, really me. It's, it's he because two of the members disappeared very shortly after uh, they got going. And so now there's an original member who still uh, performs. For a while, he was performing as Zymox. Now he performs as Clan of Zymox with some other uh, some other musicians, but yes, they are still touring, huh. and um, and uh, <laughs> you know, definitely, if you go, everybody will be wearing black. Yeah. Um, not too many people have been exposed to UV rays, but uh, it's like but the, um, a lot more the music. It's it's it's, it's like good. A precursor to uh, the emo type music. It's like new wave emo, I guess. Dark, dark emo, dark new wave, that kind of thing. Is that a I thing? like the name? By the way, yeah, the name's cool. It, it definitely is intriguing. Um, Song sucked. One of the, some of the recent um, albums that Clan of Zymox have put out are called Darkest Hour, Ooh. and another one is Kindred Spirits. Ooh. Got, got me thinking that uh, it feels in some ways like we are in some of our darkest hours. Uh, I think things could get worse. I hope they won't. I hope that we're about to turn a corner. But Kindred Spirits has me thinking that this is a really important time for us to remember other people. And that if you uh, if you don't call us or write us, you know, fair enough. But if there's somebody in your life you haven't talked to in a while, maybe someone who's been inside now for a month, maybe an aunt, maybe a relative, maybe a long lost friend, this is a good time to reach out to them. And if you can't call or write us, please take a moment to call and write them because it's really important that we remember each other and that we try and lift each other up at a time when it feels like there's a lot of things crushing us down. So uh, we're just Amen. about out of time. I've got to run to cover the mayor's uh, daily news briefing. Uh, before we go, you know, the, you know the email, you know the phone number. Um, if you would like to uh, donate to the show, Mark, how do people give us some money? Because believe it or not, people do give us money and wow. we appreciate it. That's very kind of them. Um, seriously, very kind of them. MLSolaDetroit.com, little donate button right at the top. Take it to PayPal. Yeah, so we'll be happy to accept your money. We will reinvest it in the show. Uh, we'll see if Sean hangs some new art on that back window. We know where that money's being spent. Um, <laughs> please subscribe to the podcast. Please share it with your friends. Please rate it. 
Um, and, uh, and if you look for us on Facebook, I have to tell you, we still have a problem where Facebook will not allow us to post yeah. our website. They claim that it violates their community standards, but they won't say why. So it's really important when a new episode comes up that you subscribe because it'll, it'll send you an alert that it's there. And we really appreciate if you can spread the gospel of the soul of Detroit among your friends. We won't pack you at a mega church. This is something you can do while maintaining an appropriate distance from each other. But, uh, but your participation in this show, uh, the time you give us, we appreciate it and we hope that you think it's something other people should, uh, should partake of. Boys, before we skedaddle, any, any last uh, great deep thoughts? No, I'm tapped out. Uh, yeah, me too. I'm glad you're feeling better, Mike. Yeah. It's been, I've missed you the last few weeks. So I am too. I just finished um, replastering and painting the shower in our main bathroom. Maybe we'll post some picture of that. So I'm back, baby. And I'm on right. Boulevard on East Outer Drive. So it's good to feel good again. And I hope everybody out there is feeling good, taking care of yourselves. Get lots of rest, how's, lots of hydration. How, Mr. Mark, yes, sir. How's the rest of the family? Uh, everybody's doing well. Good. Everybody. Good. Seems to Healthy be, uh, Good. nobody's fighting yet. When they're fighting, then I know that everybody's feeling fantastic. So I'm hoping we kind of maintain <laughs> it here. But before we go, I also have to mention uh, Zot, dealsinthed.com. They're back in business. They're selling cars. They're servicing vehicles. They've been a very supportive sponsor of this show. And we hope that if you can do some business with any of the dealerships that are represented by the Zot name, that you let them know ML Soul of Detroit sent you. They are trying to help people. And we hope that uh, you can help them. Uh, before I go, I need to encourage you to listen to the other shows on the Red Shovel Network. Of course, that's the No BS News Hour with Charlie LaDuff. There's No Filter Sports with Eli, Denny, and Bob. And the Mac Daddy, the flagship, the Big Kahuna, the Drew and Mike podcast, where you can catch Mark every day and a cast of thousands. So, so I can make Mayor Mike Duggan's show at 2 o'clock. <laughs> I think I'm going to ask my friend Cyrus. To take us out. Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? What is this, a sleepwalking contest? Where's your laugh, you jerk? Come on, kid. Wake up. Thanks. I did it, Dad. If you need waking up, slap on some soul of Detroit. It's skin tightener and chin chillers work like a cold slap in the face. Thanks, I needed that. Okay. Hey, um, ML, real quick. How, how far away are you from your router?